I hope everybody had a good lunch. Thank you for coming back. It gives me great pleasure to introduce Dr. Robin Green, who's been an amazing colleague of the Canadian Concussion Center since it started just the other day, well, at least 10 or 15 years ago. Robin is a full professor in the Department of Psychiatry, and she's the Saunderson Family Chair in Acquired Brain Injury at UHN, Senior Scientist in Cognitive Neuroscience at Kite uh, Rehab, uh, at Toronto Rehab. And um, she has uh, done some wonderful work in telerehabilitation uh, at the, uh, the center at TRI. And um, this has been for people who have uh, acquired brain injury in the chronic stage and more recently appealing also to lots of concussion patients. Several patients of mine have uh, benefited from tele rehab organized by Robin's team. So thank you, Robin, for doing what you do for the concussion world and uh, delightful to introduce. Thanks, Charles. Yes. Okay, welcome back, everybody. Um, just one thing I'll mention is um, we're gonna have to stick to tight timelines this afternoon because we have a speaker at three o'clock who needs to catch a plane. So I'll be a little more strict than usual about timing. Um, okay, so our uh, first speaker after lunch is our uh, keynote speaker, Dr. Javier Cardenas, who is vice chairman of the NFL. Um, he's a vice chairman and NFL head at the Neck and Spine Committee in the US. And uh, Dr. Cardenas is the director of the Rock Rockefeller Neuroscience Institute's Neuroperformance Center. He is the, the former director of the Barrow Concussion and Brain Injury Center, an inter interdisciplinary clinic that is nationally recognized for comprehensive patient care of thousands of individuals suffering from traumatic brain injury. He was also the director of the Barrow Concussion Network, the most comprehensive statewide concussion education prevention and treatment program in the hangar, the US. Dr. Cardenas provides uh, sideline concussion coverage for Arizona State University and the NFL. He serves on um, several important sports committees. He was awarded Arizona State University's Young Alumni Award, the American Academy of Neurology Advocate of the Year. That was um, in 2015. Um, and the 2016 Chicanos por la Causa Cause for a Change Award for his work in concussion prevention. He graduated from Arizona State University with highest honors and a BA in education as a special ed teacher. He instructed children with TBI and developmental disabilities. Um, and for 16 years, he volunteered for Special Olympics in Ari the Special Olympics in Arizona. He subsequently graduated from the University of Arizona College of Medicine um, with honors in neurology and completed a resident in pediatrics uh, at St. Joseph's Hospital and Medical Center where he was recognized for his outstanding care of infants and children. Dr. Cardenas trained in the Department of Child Neurology at Barrow Neurological Institute where he received awards for academic presentations and leadership. And uh, he's online with us. And can we pull up his talk and him? There we go. So he's talking today about the NFL concussion protocol. Dr. Cardenas, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Great. Afternoon, okay. everybody. Thank you for having Over me. You. Thank you for the kind introduction. Uh, far more than I deserve, that's for sure. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I hope you had a, uh, a great lunch uh, and drank lots of coffee, so um, uh, ho hopefully not bore you to tears. Um, but I'm happy to talk about uh, the NFL concussion protocol. Um, when we are thinking about this protocol, we are really thinking about um, its overall intention for uh, preventing 
uh, head injury. So there are really three components, a reduction in head impact exposure, a reduction in concussion, so the injury, of course, associated with that, and then a reduction in repeat head injuries. We heard uh, earlier from Dr. McKee that uh, there are concerns, legitimate concerns about repetitive concussions, repetitive head impacts, uh, and others that we want to make sure that we are all cognizant of and that we are doing our best to protect uh, those who are able to do so. The other component that I want to add is that when we're looking at this, we're also looking at translating it to, to uh, youth, um, which is actually a big part of what I do. So included in my disclosures are, are what you've heard in terms of my uh, affiliation with the uh, with the National Football League, but also doing this work um, for the NCAA, so for our, our college uh, and university athletes, but also for our youth athletes. Uh, and then finally, um, really taking this information uh, more broadly to those who suffer work uh, injuries, like we heard about earlier, um, but also those who suffer from falls uh, and even from uh, domestic violence, which is uh, included in, in the work that I uh, that I do. So the concussion protocol, which, by the way, is published, which is atypical for professional sports and, uh, uh, organizations, most do not publish um, publicly uh, their protocol, but we have, have done so for good intention. One is uh, to make sure everybody is aware of, of it, uh, make sure uh, that um, for those who are in the, the field and have this expertise that they can weigh in, provide great information. It is um, co-written with the Players Association. So the union uh, of athletes part that participate in these leagues, um, we wanna make sure that they have a, a say in actually what is happening. And you'll notice there's a tremendous amount of independent personnel that are utilized to keep these players safe. So it is not the coaches that are, are involved. It is not the, um, the, those who are involved in administration uh, the general managers, nor is it the ownership that is involved in evaluating the athletes or in their return to play. We train our medical personnel, our independent medical personnel on an annual basis, and the um, Players Association is also uh, involved uh, with that. At any point uh, in the season, uh, either party can raise uh, a concern for a protocol violation, um, which once again, this is the um, this is the, uh, the publication, uh, and it is revised, um, as I mentioned, annually, uh, most recently uh, last year. Now, when we're looking at the concussion protocol, we're looking at the pre-injury components, the injury components, and the post-injury. When people think about the concussion protocol, of course, they are thinking about that game day process, uh, which we will, of course, discuss as well. When we're talking about the pre-injury phase, uh, we are talking about education. We wanna make sure that the athletes are empowered to identify um, the, the um, symptoms of this injury, but also to identify the signs in their teammates. The pre-participation examination includes a history of concussion, neurological comorbidities. Uh, we know, uh, of course, that there are a number of them that um, can prolong recovery, including migraine, uh, including anxiety, depression, cognitive uh, history of, of deficit, learning disability, et cetera. And then the evaluation is largely based on the, uh, on the SCAT-5. Um, we hope to hear from the concussion and sport group uh, very soon about some revisions to that uh, and a subsequent uh, SCAT-6, which is a sport concussion assessment test. Um, and then cognitive testing, uh, both computerized and uh, paper and pencil. So really a hybrid model for uh, cognitive uh, evaluations. In terms of prevention, we have a, a high standard um, for, for helmets. In fact, this uh, testing is done uh, uniquely. So all the information was derived from the field in terms of the magnitude, the force, the speed um, of these impacts, and then uh, created uh, a laboratory testing um, for all uh, NFL helmets, which uh, is different than those for um, uh, the NCAA or even for youth um, because of the speed, weight, um, and force that these athletes can generate. And out of it has come uh, this, uh, this helmet poster. Um, and when this uh, came out, what we have seen 
is historically the improvement in the material science was pretty linear, meaning every year we would get this incremental improvement in testing. Since this challenge came about, since the uh, advent and concern has been heightened, um, the, for every year of development, we're getting seven to eight years of improvement. And that really goes to the, um, to the engineers, the biomechanists, the, those who are um, looking at the material science of these uh, helmets. And in fact, as you see at the bottom, the prohibited helmets, the red, um, that actually was not the case before. They were included in this, uh, in, in the ability to, to wear these uh, by our athletes, um, but they are, they are changing. This is intentionally a moving target, target so that we can improve the safety um, of the athletes that are wearing them. Now, you may or may not have heard of something that was uh, utilized um, the last few years, and that is something called the guardian cap. Now, the guardian cap was not designed to reduce concussions. In fact, um, it was designed to reduce head, um, head impact exposure. And there are three ways that we're currently looking at head impact exposure. The first is the volume, the sheer number of hits. The second is the density, um, the amount of hits in a given, a, a given a period of time. And then, of course, the intensity of those head impacts. Now, the guardian cap was specifically designed to reduce um, the uh, intensity. And in fact, we saw a 52% reduction uh, in the actual um, uh, number of concussion, uh, number of injuries without an increase uh, in game time um, uh, uh, concussions. Now that game day medical team, when we're looking at people and personnel, um, you'll notice that they are, there's a lot of independent people. So this is the first set, the unaffiliated neurotrauma consultant. This is a person who wears a red hat on the sidelines uh, and is there to uh, evaluate uh, athletes. They have to have a certain level of expertise in traumatic brain injury and concussion and also have to have this competency uh, in their training. Um, the same is also true uh, in the booth uh, where they co-locate with the spotters. So these are the video spotters who are um, uh, looking out for injury behavior and emphasize injury behavior because we all see these impacts and some of them might be high in magnitude, but the athlete um, uh, get pops right up versus a lower magnitude hit and the athlete is slow to get up or they have trouble or they are off balance. Now, this um, independent system of sideline individuals started um, about 10 years ago, and in fact, their role has evolved. I would argue as a member of the uh, one of those individuals who was there at the very beginning, um, just us being there was enough for many people, whether it was for uh, the players, the coaches, the league, uh, or even the general public. Our presence there was enough. However, over time, the expectation has raised as well, which is fair and it should be. 2016 they expanded to look at at stingers or neuropraxic changes. Um, and the reason for this is because there was a concern that some athletes would would hide their concussive injury by saying, oh well no, it's just my shoulder or I just got a stinger. Uh, and so we are looking uh, at those um, uh, athletes as well who suffer other types of injuries. But our greatest expansion of course occurred in 2017, when we became part of the entire um, uh, medical uh, team, a pregame medical meeting, um, which not only goes over concussive injury, but also the emergency action planning. We saw this last year, uh, a cardiac arrest uh, on the field. So part of that pregame preparation uh, is actually making sure we identify who is going to run the code. For those of you not involved um, in, in athletics and head injury, the things that kill athletes, especially our youth athletes, are heat, heart, and head. Uh, and head is actually at the bottom of that with a sudden cardiac arrest at the top. So we want to make sure that we are looking at all, uh, all injuries. Coming back to concussion, we these, uh, these independent individuals participate in the preseason uh, education. Um, they have to use uh, electronic means for uh, reporting their information, which we have 100% compliance. Um, and then there is the um, medical review by the uh, Players Association, so the union, as well as the league. 
And then there was an addition of having uh, somebody who is on the field actually go up to the booth with the spotters to provide that additional uh, education and expertise uh, to those individuals. Now, when it comes to these evaluations, um, uh, for there's uh, on average a 1.6 evaluations uh, per game. And in fact, when we look at these evaluations, there are three to four evaluations per concussion that is diagnosed. And we're actually quite comfortable with that. And the reason we're comfortable with that is we'd rather evaluate more athletes, even if they might not exhibit um, uh, behavior and might not have a concussion uh, in order to catch that. And in fact, when we look at the statistics, um, <clears throat> when it comes to game day evaluations and then a later diagnosis of concussions, so let's say the athlete is evaluated and we miss something. Well, that happens about one to 2% of the time where the athlete will report either the next day or two days where they have a delayed onset uh, of symptoms. So um, it's a pretty, pretty good marker, 98%, um, but we're always looking for that one to 2% to improve our diagnostic accuracy, including looking at um, things like uh, biomarkers, whether they be blood-based, saliva-based, or even physiologic. Now, also in terms of the, uh, the group that is involved in uh, injury, specific concussive injury prevention, we have uh, athletic trainers that are um, uh, in the, uh, in the booth. Um, these are, uh, these are often physios and, in, in, in Canada, um, they have a minimum of 10 years experience. They have to have college and or professional, uh, experience and not be affiliated with the club for greater than five years. Um, they monitor the game. They are trained to watch video and look for injury behavior, uh, on a regular basis. And they're only ones that actually can stop the game for a medical reason. So this is the evolution of this program. We had one person watching both sides initially, and then we had two, and then we added techs, and then we added um, the, uh, the Booth UNC to the program. So all of these programs have evolved over time and to uh, increase our, our accuracy and the fidelity around this particular uh, injury. Recognizing that um, the resources of the league are much higher than, than uh, either other professional organizations or even universities, there are many of these things that can be adapted and, and actually having somebody in the booth monitoring the, for video and video signs of injury uh, is one of them that can uh, that can occur. And then there's the post injury uh, the neuropsychologist um, who also does the pre uh, the baseline uh, evaluations and training. They oversee in, um, uh, the, the cognitive uh, assessment. Um, for each club, and each club has uh, a neuropsychologist that will perform these uh, baseline and post-injury uh, tests. Now, uh, once again, another independent individual is the uh, independent neurotrauma consultant. So this is uh, much like many of you, somebody who sees the athlete in the clinical setting after an injury um, in which they have many of the criteria as the sideline individuals. In fact, we encourage them to also attend on the sideline because um, seeing an injury uh, in real life uh, is, uh, is always uh, very interesting um, but all, and, and can be um, many times uh, academic. But um, uh, when we're in the clinic, hindsight is always 2020. It's always easy to make that diagnosis, it seems, in the clinic. So having both perspectives is, uh, is incredibly uh, important. Now, this individual is also responsible for collaborating with the team physician for final clearance. So once again, an independent uh, in, uh, neurological consultant um, who uh, participates in the uh, return to play process. Now, I'm going to show you uh, an injury. He's got a field wide open, Brandon Cooks. And he gets smacked down at the... Now, indeed, these can be incredibly dramatic, um, uh, incredibly concerning, of course. Now, this was actually in the Super Bowl uh, a few years ago. Not all of them, of course, are as obvious as this. Uh, and I'll show you why I'm showing this uh, uh, in just a moment. Um, you can see that from a video standpoint, we can have multiple angles in order to view this. Now, the reason why I wanted to show this is to highlight the, the people that you see. The person in the red hat is the unaffiliated neurotrauma consultant, the athlete just in front of him, and then the team physician in front of him. And behind the red-headed person is the athletic trainer. So a number of medical personnel 
involved in the assessment of this particular uh, athlete. Now, um, looking at the game day process. So now we are in what most people consider uh, the protocol when it comes to the concussion. This is also something that is reviewed on an annual basis um, and also something that um, is used in terms of this, uh, this checklist. So what exactly uh, is it? So this is the, uh, the game day checklist um, in which we, um, we use our, our game day personnel uh, for the evaluation of concussion uh, on the field and during game play. Who may initiate it? Well, in fact, just about anybody can initiate this process. It can be a teammate, it can be a coach, it can be a game official. Can be the spotter, which of course is um, uh, very common, and then the team physician or the unaffiliated neurotrauma consultant can initiate the process. And once again, very rarely do you have that that that, that um, diagnosis right off the bat from, let's say, video. But there are some indicators um, from video that can provide that. And we'll go over those in just a moment. What I'm happy to report also is that we have made great efforts over the years to once again empower uh, the athletes for self-reporting. And in fact, uh, over since 2018, 2000, 2022, when we've been tracking this, um, over 30% of the evaluations were triggered by the athlete themselves. This is where the athlete comes up and says, I don't feel right, something's not right, I have a headache, I have vision change, um, can you evaluate me? Now, not uh, um, uh, when, and these are, these are the concussed ones, believe it or not, there are more than that who will also present who say, hey, I have something wrong. Can you make sure it's not a concussion? Can you um, evaluate me? Um, and this is uh, quite humbling, in fact, when we're able to um, empower the athletes to identify this in themselves. Now, during that initiation, if they have signs or symptoms of concussion or concerns raised, as I mentioned, just about anybody, they must go uh, undergo an assessment. So uh, the reason why I bring this up is because there are, uh, in the past, you, there have been uh, times when somebody say, well, you might want to evaluate number 23 the next time it's convenient for you. No, as soon as there's a concerned raise, no matter who does it, then the, evaluate, the evaluation must happen immediately, not when it's convenient for the athlete or the team or the coach or um, the team physicians. Now, there are some no-go criteria, and it's important to have these no-go criteria because even in the athlete who looks fantastic afterwards, we want to make sure that they are removed from play regardless of how good they look. So the athlete that has an impact seizure, fencing response, athlete that has confusion or amnesia, meaning the, um, the athletic trainer goes out onto the field and they're un the athlete is unconscious, even if for a, a second or two the athlete demonstrates ataxia, then they are designated as a no-go, meaning they must be removed from play once again, no matter how good they look. For those of you who do this on the sidelines, you may have experienced an athlete who is knocked unconscious and you assess them. Uh, they report that they're asymptomatic, their testing is perfect, but even in those cases, they must be removed from play. So this is to highlight indeed those um, criteria for no go. Now, the medical timeout once again is a tool, and this is to make sure that the athlete does not incur further impact, potentially um, uh, increasing their um, their risk of injury. So this is where the uh, booth may uh, stop the game. They have direct communication with the referee. Uh, in which they say medical timeout three times, they identify the player, and then the uh, player is escorted to the sidelines uh, so that they may be uh, evaluated. Now, what does that sideline uh, survey look like? What does it uh, entail? So this is the first half of the uh, evaluation um, phase. So looking at um, uh, this is done, of course, uh, in the tent. So their helmet is removed so that they can't run back out onto the pitch. Um, they, this test, uh, testing must be done in the medical tent, no longer um, on, the, on the bench that's on the sidelines. Um, the team physician and the independent personnel must be present uh, together in order for this to happen. As I mentioned, it is done in a tent. 
Admittedly, when these first came out, I was a little skeptical because as you can imagine, those stadiums are quite noisy uh, and by no means does it reduce the noise. However, there are many visual distractions that can occur um, uh, when you're on a sideline, uh, including seeing something on the video board um, or something that's exciting. So this allows um, for this ability to avoid visual distractions. Additionally, it allows for um, some privacy. And, and by that, I mean medical privacy. So for athletes, uh, when we have video cameras all around, um, uh, audio all around, um, this allows that uh, evaluation to uh, occur because, it, uh, of course, it is uh, a health-related issue. Now, the sideline evaluation is intended uh, as a screen. It is a go versus a no-go decision. It is not always a final diagnosis. In fact, rarely is it a final diagnosis. Um, they are designed to recognize, prevent further injury. Also, we're looking beyond just concussion. We're looking for those injuries that might represent a subdural hematoma or subarachnoid hemorrhage. Um, so we're looking more for more serious injury than concussion as well. Um, we also know that can be delayed onset of, uh, of symptoms um, and that uh, it's not always obvious. Um, and just like in other levels of play, um, the mantra is when in doubt, sit them out. Now, that first question, of course, is, uh, you know, tell me what happened. We want to get the sequence of the injury. For those of you who do this work in the clinic, you'll know, all right, tell me exactly what happened from your perspective. Um, and if there's a gap in memory, hey, you've got your diagnosis. Um, but then if they don't have a gap in memory, meaning they don't say I was running down the field, next thing I know, um, you know, my teammates helping me up or next thing I know, uh, I'm on the bench. Um, uh, we don't ask, are you okay? We always know that athletes, of course, um, can be missing an arm. They'll say they're fine. Um, uh, but clearly, if there's any alteration of uh, consciousness or memory, uh, we want to make sure we uh, remove them from play. Second question, of course, is, um, all right, well, if you have no gap in memory, tell me how you felt when you had that impact. Well, I, uh, I was, you know, my, my vision went blurry. I got dizzy. Well, those are indications of a neurological change. Therefore, you were removed. Um, or I was really irritated. I've had times when an athlete was on his hands and knees, and I thought, why, why were you so slow to get up? In fact, he said, I, you know, I bit my tongue, and I was spitting blood. And, of course, we reviewed the video, and sure enough, you can but on first um, perspective, it was not like that. But in fact, when they don't have a neurological change, of course, that's uh, important as well. So looking at these uh, signs um, uh, and uh, symptoms associated with the injury, uh, these are indications um, for, uh, for removal from play. Uh, and if they have a, a, a other things like a facial injury, of course, we wanna make sure we do this evaluation. Now, uh, we're not naive to know that athletes always want to go back in. In fact, I referenced uh, Dr. Mike McRae's uh, study looking at 41% that didn't want to leave, 66% didn't thought it was didn't think it was a serious injury, um, and other um, uh, other athletes who uh, who felt that they could just simply play through. Fortunately, there's more data out there that suggests that uh, early removal from play can actually shorten your recovery. Uh, and so this is part of the educational piece um, and arguably one of the reasons why um, athletes, uh, more athletes are, are self-reporting. Now, in terms of the, uh, the video, of course, there are, there are um, key indicators and this comes from, the, um, from that international consensus um, around the, uh, the SCAT-5. Uh, these are a few of them, uh, lying motionlessness, uh, having some balance difficulties when uh, when looking at that uh, that assessment, um, are all uh, are all uh, reasons that blank look, which admittedly is much harder in uh, a helmeted sport, uh, and once again facial injury afterwards. So this is uh, the video cart that we have uh, on the sideline. Um, we'll see just a brief demonstration of uh, what is actually uh, utilized. Uh, have uh, additional headphones, which uh, are noise canceling, so we can uh, review the video, go back and forth, get various angles. And once again, we are looking at the post-impact aspect uh, behavior of the, uh, of the uh, injury. 
Um, many of the um, the key items that we're looking for uh, come from this international study on video review. And so here are just a few of them, um, uh, lying motionless, uh, impact seizure, uh, slow to get up, ataxia, um, are reasons, are, are video signs uh, that can indicate uh, a concussion has occurred. As mentioned earlier, this is still a clinical uh, diagnosis, um, not one that has a, at least currently, um, an objective uh, biomarker um, for that diagnosis. Continuing with this sideline survey, um, uh, these are what the elements that are covered, looking at those no-go criteria, taking the history of the event, the signs and symptoms, Maddox questions, which we'll review in just a moment, and that video review, as I mentioned. So the Maddox questions, where are we at, uh, which half or quarter or period, depending on your sport, um, who do uh, who scored last, Who'd you play last week? Uh, and then did you win? The, um, the research and science behind this, of course, is published by, um, uh, by David Maddox. Um, and it looked uh, really at comparisons between um, what we would consider our typical orientation type questions, the name, the date, year, um, uh, month, et cetera, versus what, were, what would be uh, considered more recent memory items having to do uh, with the athlete and having to do with their uh, game day play. And you can see the sensitivity is much higher uh, in those um, who were concussed than not concussed. Um, and that is why uh, we utilize this tool. The uh, rest of the evaluation, aside from the history or cognitive aspect, is looking at the neck. Um, it's critically important, of course. Uh, we see many uh, neck injuries associated with head injuries and concussion and vice versa. An evaluation of speech, uh, of gait, eye movements, uh, as well as a pupillary examination. When looking at those eye movements, um, we know, especially in our younger athletes, nystagmus uh, can occur. It can be normal, endpoint, non-sustained. Uh, however, it's, it's persistent or spontaneous, then clearly they need to be removed from play and many times need to go to the hospital. And then what you see illustrated in the picture at the bottom, looking at psychotic intrusions um, uh, as uh, an abnormal uh, eye movement uh, finding. Convergence, of course, is also um, uh, near point of convergence, specifically also uh, an area that we have been investigating, of course, even at the sidelines, on average, um, the uh, normal is, uh, is less than six to six and a half centimeters in this population um, with some of the uh, uh, variants, um, depending on the history of an eye abnormality. Now, if any of these are, are positive for concussion, inclusive uh, or suspicious, then they must have a complete uh, evaluation. Um, this is the second part of the um, uh, of the assessment. Now, I will tell you that for uh, for every athlete that's evaluated uh, in the tent, uh, about um, thirty percent of them um, are are diagnosed and they're removed, and another uh, seventy percent or so are actually returned uh, to the game. The numbers flip over when you go to the locker room. Um, meaning that 75% uh, or so are diagnosed with concussion after the locker room evaluation, whereas 25 are actually returned. I mention that because many people assume that a, an evaluation means a diagnosis on the sidelines and others um, assume that, well, if you're going to go to the higher level of uh, an evaluation, then indeed you're going to end up with that diagnosis, but that is actually not the case. Now this assessment um, includes that complete uh, neurological examination, which of course is largely derived uh, from the uh, SCAT-5 uh, and of course the research and data coming uh, therein. If the assessment is normal, then they get to return to play. <laughs> if not, then uh, they have to go um, uh, remain in the locker room. They have to be observed um, for any medical deterioration. Now, since this multimodal approach um, to concussion um, has been initiated, you can see an overall uh, decrease uh, in concussion injuries with, with our low being 2021. And then of course we did have an increase uh, last year, a very public one, uh, of course, um, and, and indeed 
um, greater efforts were made to further define and refine um, the protocol um, because of that. Um, you can see there are a number of things that have been implemented in order to um, make this uh, a reduction or create a reduction in injury. I won't go over the entirety of the return to play uh, process, but once again, you'll for those of you who um, who are involved in any international uh, consensus, you will notice this five step process, <laughs> um, not unlike the six step process. Um, uh, that involves symptom limited activity. You'll notice it's not symptom free in part because we know that athletes um, uh, even at baseline uh, are symptomatic and we're looking not to exacerbate that. We're also looking to encourage physical activity because we know that it is um, therapeutic, especially for the athlete um, and that they can engage in activities um, uh, before contact that actually healthy activity physical activity is indeed important now in order to return to a game um, or a subsequent game um, this final clearance must happen with the independent neurological consultant um, uh, in order for them to have that final clearance so looking at some of that participation 2015 to 20 uh, 2020 um, the average uh, re recovery time was about nine days. Now, um, there were fewer than 30% uh, of the athletes who had a game on Sunday or were injured in a Sunday game and had a, a game on a subsequent Sunday um, that actually went back uh, to play. So most of them, um, the vast majority missed uh, a, a game. Um, and in fact, zero uh, who had a Thursday night game after a Sunday injury actually uh, returned. All right. So what is the, um, the, the, the what are the take home messages from this that we have a lot of independent uh, personnel um, for uh, for this particular injury at the professional level? This is really built around communication, collaboration and consistency. Video use um, can help. Of course, it is not uh, typically a diagnostic marker. Um, we leave that ultimate diagnostic authority with, with the physician, with another clinician in order to, um, to make that, but we use our, our collaborators uh, to help. And it really is looking at those three components, pre-injury, injury, and post-injury to reduce head impact, to reduce concussive injury, and to reduce pre repeat injury. Uh, I appreciate uh, your time. Uh, I, and I'm open, uh, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Cardenas. Um, we do have time for a couple questions. Go ahead. Do you mind just speaking loudly? It doesn't seem to be on. Uh, thank you very much for your talk. I have a general question, which is, between the time you remove a player from the field and they return to play, is are there any some sort of uh, rehabilitation protocol uh, that are uh, provided by the, the club or the team to help recover quickly? And I think particularly some sort of cognitive or even uh, uh, visual spatial uh, attention protocol, rehabilitation protocol. Thank you very much. So when it comes to um, the uh, return to play uh, protocol, um, we do leave it up to the individual team physicians to prescribe a re rehabilitation uh, process to their individual athlete, just as you would to um, an individual uh, patient. So there is not a specific um, uh, prescribed method for that rehabilitation. Some use various resources such as vestibular therapy, some use ocular motor therapy, some use neurocognitive, uh, speech cognitive uh, therapy as their, as their modalities. And many times it's multimodal in that rehabilitation um, uh, phase for the athletes. Um, part of this, of course, is that we actually don't know the timing of, of when um, uh, therapeutic intervention uh, is key. And I can tell you for sure, for those athletes that have a longer than typical recovery, those modalities are used um, more aggressively than the athlete who uh, assumes a typical recovery phase. Go ahead, Carmela. 
thank you for a wonderful talk and it's actually um you know great to see all the initiatives that you guys have taken to really protect the athletes and so i guess i'm wondering do you know about other um athletic groups who are are maybe reaching out to you guys to maybe adopt some of your practices you you know i mean one would hope some people would be leveraging all you guys have learned Absolutely. So there are a number of, of uh, collaborations that we have actually throughout the world um, when it comes to other collision sports, because those tend to be more akin um, to what we experience, including the National Hockey League, Canadian Football League, uh, World Rugby, Australian Rules Football. Um, those uh, are collaborations that we have where we share information. Most recently, we've been collaborating with the Premier League for we're looking at, at soccer or, or uh, other types of, of football. Um, and so, yes, we, we do collaborate. We also do so with, um, with our uh, colleges and universities, um, as well as our youth. So there's a program we're really trying to emphasize flag football. Um, so non-impact uh, processes um, to participate in this sport, but still not engage yet uh, in, in head impacts. Uh, Dr. Cardenas, I want to thank you very much for an excellent presentation, and it's really interesting to hear about uh, the progress that you've made so far with the protocol. Thank you very much for joining us thank today. Thank you for the opportunity and for speaking at such a wonderful conference, so thank you.